Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We'd love to have you. In our last lesson, we covered uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 23 and just started into 24. But in, in chapter 23, we saw the divisions of the Levites. In other words, Levites that were not priests. In, verse, in chapter 24, on the other hand, we have uh, come to the divisions of the priests. And the Lord turning, David with the Lord's help and instruction, turning over a very organized nation to Solomon. Solomon, 19, 20 years old when he assumed the throne. And that's a lot of responsibility for basically a teenager. But uh, David doing a good job of getting things ready for his son Solomon. And we see the priests divided or being divided up into 24 courses. Now, there were 16, and we learned in the last verse we covered yesterday of chapter 24, verse 4, there were 16 divisions that were of the descendants of Eleazar. There were eight divisions or courses that were descendants of Ithamar, both of those the only surviving sons of Aaron, who was the first high priest. So with that in introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we cover the uh, courses, the 24 courses of the priests. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 24, verse 5, and it reads, Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, one as the other, in other words. For the governors or rulers of the sanctuary and governors of the house of God were the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar. Now this is not to be understood that the 24 uh, men who are about to be named were high priests. They weren't. They were simply heads of households. They, they were distinguished and they were powerful uh, people of their tribe of the priesthood, but they were not high priest. But they were responsible for making sure that the, the porters, uh, the musicians, the other Levites, the other priests uh, were accountable and responsible for fulfilling their responsibilities during their particular course. Now, keep in mind too, these courses, they didn't change the name when the man died. They continued for centuries and centuries and centuries, as we're going to see in our lesson today. We're going to tie the book of First Chronicles to uh, the first chapter of the book of Luke in our lesson today. And another important thing to remember is that they served one week, uh, Sabbath to Sabbath. Uh, the last day of their service uh, during their particular course was the day before a Sabbath. So they then the, the next course began, and of course they couldn't travel on the Sabbath day. Tra travel was very limited as far as how far you could go on a Sabbath day. Well, you might say, well, there's 24 weeks that are covered by this because they started with course one, went through 24. Well, there's more weeks in the year than that. Well, you deduct it exactly right. So when one set of courses ran through 1 through 24, they started over and ran 1 through 24 again. Well, that only comes up to 48 weeks. So, and there's a few more weeks in the year than 48. How do you explain that? Well, during the major ingatherings, Passover and the corresponding Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
Uh, then you had the Feast of Weeks, which we call uh, Pentecost today. And then lastly, you had the week-long Feast of Tabernacles. And all of the priests came to Jerusalem to serve on that. But while they were in Jerusalem for their course, when that was finished, then they would go home and wait till there was their course again. More on that in a moment. Verse 6. And Shemaiah, the son of Nethaniel, the scribe, one of the Levites wrote them, in other words, wrote down the names of those who came by lot, selected by the Urim and Thummim, before the king, that's David, and the princes, and Zadok, the priest, one of the high priests, which was located at Gibeon, where the Mosaic tabernacle was located at this time, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, <clears throat> the Abiathar with David from Ziklag in his days in Hebron when he was king over Judah only. And before the chief of the fathers of the priest and Levites, one principal household, in the Hebrew this is house of the father, being taken for Eleazar and one taken for Ithamar. Now, it's not written, but they had to have some type of logical means of doing this. Uh, some scholars think that they probably took two urns, and in one urn they pay, placed the 16 lots for the descendants of Eleazar, and in the other urn they placed the eight uh, names of those who were descendants of Ithamar. <clears throat> then either they drew two, drew, drew two out for Eleazar and then one for Ithamar, or possibly they alternated one for Eleazar, one for Ithamar, until the eight of Ithamar had been exhausted, and then they drew the, the, the rest would be of the house of Eleazar only. <clears throat> now it's also important for you to understand that there were two uh, years that the Hebrews recognized. First, you had the calendar year, which most of you know began with the month of Abib, or Nisan, it's also called in the Old Testament. Now that began uh, from the, at the spring equinox each year. But the Hebrews also recognized a civil year, <clears throat> and that's what these courses of the priest were established on, was the civil year. <clears throat> Excuse me, after the Feast of Tabernacles, the very next day was the first day of the next civil year. And that is also when the first course of the priest began. And my point in explaining all this so clearly is that it's through understanding these courses and the dates that they served in Jerusalem that we're going to be able to establish the conception date and the birth date of John the Baptist. And if you can do that, and you know that John the Baptist was six months senior to Jesus Christ, you're able to establish the conception date and the birth date of Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a surprise to many of you that it, his birth date is not December 25th. Now, this uh, beginning of the civil year occurred on the Hebrew calendar on the 22nd of Tishri, which was the seventh month. Uh, that would equate to approximately October 6th. So if you take uh, the Jehoiarib, who we're going to see in our next verse, was the first lot, uh, his uh, time of service began the week of October 6th. But again, keep in mind that it wasn't just one week a year that they served. They went the rotation of 1 through 24, and then began 1 through 24 again. So there are actually two uh, sets of weeks that each course, uh, more on that in a moment. Verse 7, Now the first lot by the Urim and Thummim came forth to Jehoiarib, the second to Jediah, <clears throat> verse 8, the third to Harim, the fourth to Seorim, uh, sharpen up for me, the fifth to Malchiah, the sixth to Mihabin, Mihamin, and the tenth, the se excuse me, on verse 10, the seventh to Hakoz, and the eighth to Abiah. Now I want you to underline Abiah. 
because it is through understanding this course that we're able to establish dates of the conception, birth of uh, both John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, the course of Abiah. Now, let's turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 5, as we continue this study. Very important study. And Luke chapter 1 is where we're going. And we're going to pick it up with verse 5, and it reads, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. Underline it. It's spelled a little differently. Why? Because the New Testament is translated or transliterated from the Greek, the Old Testament, from the Hebrew. Both the same course, both the eighth course, on the Hebrew civil year. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth means, if you translate it, rather than transliterate it, oath of Yah. And it would be through Elizabeth that God would fulfill his promise that of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, that a forerunner would come. It would be through Mary that another oath of God would come, and that is the forerunner announced the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Interesting to note, Elisheba, as it's pronounced in the Hebrew language, was also the name of Aaron's wife. You can document that in Exodus chapter 6, verse 23. Now, Elizabeth was of the daughters of Aaron. Well, why is that important? Well, that means that a priest could legally wed that woman. You see, if a man of Judah wanted to take a wife of, let's say, the tribe of Manasseh, there was no problem with that. It happened all the time. <clears throat> the only restrictions on which tribe you could marry were of the Levites, and more specifically, the descendants of Aaron, because it was through that, that priesthood that line, seed line, which led to uh, the seed line of Jesus Christ through Mary. Because you see, Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. Their, their mothers were sisters. Uh, they were both of the daughters of Aaron. Uh, we also learn that in chapter 3 of this uh, book of Luke, that Heli of Judah was the father of Mary. So Mary was both of the king line, Judah, and the priest line, Levi. <clears throat> Verse 6, And they were both righteous before God, that's referring to Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. They were good people. They loved the Lord and served the Lord. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. This I couldn't help but think about Abraham and Sarah when I read this. That you see, Abraham was had had children by other women, but Sarah was barren until she was 89, and she conceived. And uh, Isaac was the result born when she was 90. Uh, Abraham was 99 when Isaac was conceived, 100 when he was born. <clears throat> Verse 8, it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, he was in Jerusalem serving on the course of Abiah. And uh, keep that in mind, it's very important. Verse 9, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. In the inner uh, court of the temple, you had the altar of burnt offering. You also had the ta to showbread table, uh, the golden candlestick, the menorah. And you also had the golden altar of incense. And uh, Zacharias, his assignment as a priest, and you see only the priest could enter the inner court. You had to be a priest to enter the inner court. 
and uh, his, his responsibility was offering up incense to the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, at the hour they knew that the incense was being offered on the altar of burnt, uh, of incense offering. Now, what the, the thought was that their prayers went up to heaven, ascended to heaven with the smoke from the, the burning of the incense, hoping that their prayers would be taken up before the Lord and heard of him. <clears throat> and there appeared unto him, to Zacharias the priest, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Now this is not just any ordinary angel. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is the archangel. Uh, if you translate his name, the mighty man of God, Gabriel, we'll learn in verse 19. <clears throat> and when Zacharias saw uh, him, referring to Gabriel, he was troubled in fear fell upon him. You know, uh, that most people in their entire life don't see an angel uh, from God. And it would be rather startling. It would take you aback, even if you were a priest. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Hmm, it wasn't just the prayers of the people that were going up with the incense smoke. Uh, Zacharias had a prayer of his own. What was it that Zacharias prayed for? And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. That's what he was praying for. And thou shalt call his name John. John means Yahweh's gift or Yahweh's favor. And what a favor and a gift John was. As I mentioned earlier, he prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40, Verse 3, <clears throat> make way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight the highway of our God. Now, John, one of seven people named by God himself before they were born. <clears throat> Verse 14, and they shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Why would many rejoice at his birth, well, as I mentioned, he was the one, was that voice in the wilderness that said, make way for the Lord, make straight the highway for our God. <clears throat> he was the forerunner. That means Messiah was to come. Not only were many at that point in time uh, filled with joy and gladness, we should be filled with joy and gladness that that came to pass as well. Verse 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. <coughs> Excuse me. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. If we continued on in this chapter far enough, we would learn that after Mary conceived with Jesus Christ, she went directly to her cousin Elizabeth's house. And John the Baptist was six months in his mother's womb. And when Jesus and Mary, when Mary came in with Jesus in her womb, John leapt in the womb at the presence of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now this neither to drink wine nor uh, strong drink, and it means that he was to be uh, under the vow of a Nazarite from birth. Verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. The purpose of John the Baptist, he came in the spirit of Elijah. <clears throat> now don't misquote me, I didn't say, <clears throat> excuse me, that John the Baptist was Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. And the Lord promised in the last two verses of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, uh, verses 5 and 6, that he would send Elijah to return the hearts of the children to the fathers. That's plural. There are two fathers. One, Yahweh. One is Satan. <clears throat> Verse 17. And he shall go before him, John the Baptist, 
shall go before Christ. He came before Christ, six months, the elder, in the spirit and power of Elias. That's the Greek <coughs> transliteration for Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers, there are two, to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready people uh, prepared for the Lord. That's the commission of the Elijah ministry. I like to think that this ministry is part of that Elijah ministry. How do you prepare people for their Lord? Well, you seal them with the Word of God in their minds. That uh, prevents them from being deceived by the Antichrist. Yes, we are involved in returning the hearts to the Father, that's singular, but with a capital F, uh, by teaching God's Word, sealing the Word of God in the minds, preparing them for the Lord, preparing them that the Antichrist comes first, then Jesus Christ returns so that they're not deceived. Verse 18, And Zacharias said unto the angel, <clears throat> Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. They were both uh, very up in age. Uh, basically what Zacharias is asking here for is a sign. And that's a little bit of, uh, of an insult uh, to uh, Gabriel and the Lord. Uh, here God sent an archangel to announce this good news and he's asking for a sign. That kind of indicates that he doesn't believe what Gabriel is saying. <clears throat> Verse 19, And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. In other words, I have the face or the attention of God at any time I choose and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Perhaps uh, Zechariah thought the promise of a child was too late. Uh, Mary, on the other hand, is going to find the promise that Gabriel makes to her perhaps a little too early. Verse 20, and, and you see in that Gabriel saying, and you, I, I'm sent to you to give you these good tidings, and you don't believe me. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak <clears throat> until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. There he said it just like it is. You don't believe me, Zacharias, and shall be fulfilled in their season. And this to me means that uh, Zacharias was to remain dumb, speechless, until John the Baptist was born because that's what was promised the coming of Zacharias. So we're talking about nine months that he would be dumb. You know, why was this, does that seem like a bit severe to you? Well, not really. You see, Zacharias is a priest. He should have been familiar with, Zech with Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 that voice of one in the wilderness crying, make way for the Lord, make straight the highway for our God. And he wasn't. <clears throat> Verse 21, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. What, what could be taking him so long? And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. This word beckoned in the Greek is dianuo. It means to express with signs. You see, he couldn't speak. He was dumb. So he was reduced to doing the best he could with sign languages or, or hand signals. <clears throat> Verse 23. And it came to pass, as soon as the days of his menstruation was, were accomplished, he departed to his own house. So we talked about the course of Abiah being two possibilities during the course of the civil year. <clears throat> Considering and remembering that the first course started on October 6th 
It doesn't take a real mathematician to figure out eight weeks later, you have, that was the eighth course, you remember, they serve one week each. So Abaya, the first one after the beginning of the civil year, would fall on December 6th through the 12th. That's not the course that Zacharias was serving, uh, the dates that he was serving at the time of these events. The second course of Abaya is June 13th through the 19th. That is the course that we're talking about here. Uh, I'll document that logically here in a moment. <clears throat> now, understanding that uh, his course was completed, his ministration, that means the course was finished on uh, June the 19th. Now, he couldn't travel the next day because that was a Sabbath. And as I said earlier, the travel was very restricted, how far you could go on a Sabbath. So he could not have left for home until the next day after that, which would have been the 20th of June. Now, he lived uh, 30 miles approximately from Jerusalem. And being an elderly man, it probably took him two days to cover because they didn't have cars to jump in and, and run down the highway. Uh, putting him at home on June 21st or 22nd. And what we're going to see is that John the Baptist was conceived, the forerunner was conceived on June 23rd or 24th. He was born on March 28th or 29th. Then, knowing that Jesus Christ was six months junior to John the Baptist, the conception date of Jesus Christ was December 25th, his birth date September 29th, of course, of the following year. <clears throat> the course of Abaya lets us determine when John the Baptist was conceived and when he was born, therefore when Jesus was conceived and when Jesus was born. Verse 24, and after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying. So uh, he got home on the 21st uh, or 22nd. She conceived uh, Elizabeth on the 23rd or 24th. Then five months later, that puts us at June 23rd or 24th. And what I mean by that, if you add five months to that, puts you at November 24th. This that she uh, hid herself means that she concealed herself all around. Uh, why? Well, uh, John the Baptist was to be uh, under the vow of a Nazarite from birth. So it goes without saying that Elizabeth was to uh, avoid any defilements, uh, probably was prohibited from, uh, to, uh, to, from uh, drinking alcoholic beverages as well. <clears throat> Verse 25. Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. A, a woman that had, was barren was seeing that was, that was disgraceful. And what she's saying is, thank you for taking away my disgrace. Well, Elizabeth is a happy girl, a happy lady at this point. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth. All right, the sixth month, uh, John the Baptist was conceived on November 23rd, or, or excuse me, June 23rd or 24th. We're six months away from that point in time. We're at December 25th, verse 27 to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. The word espoused, uh, probably a little strong in our uh, vocabulary. He's, she was engaged uh, to Joseph. She was a virgin. Of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, uh, Joseph was of also the tribe of Judah, but Joseph's genealogy has absolutely nothing to do with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was an immaculate conception. 
Mary is the only one that had anything to do with the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And as I said earlier, she was half of the tribe of Levi, half of the tribe of Judah. Verse 28, And the angel came in unto her, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, much graced. She was much graced, we are much graced. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And what a blessing her son would be to the world. Verse 29, And when she saw him, referring to Gabriel, the archangel, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind, this means she was disturbed and deliberated, what manner of salutation this could, should be, what, what possible sort of salutation is this. And again, the promise to Zacharias that he would uh, have a son and name him John seemed a little late. Uh, this promise from Gabriel seems to Mary to be a little early. You see, she had never been with a man. Thus fulfilling Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which states a virgin will conceive, and you'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, December the 25th, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name uh, Jesus, Jesus, if you translate it, uh, the Hebrew language, the name is Yeshua. If you translate it, it means Yahweh's Savior. The Word became flesh at that point in time. Verse 32, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's why it's so important for you to know the key of David, that key that opens doors that no man can shut and shuts doors that no man can open. Now, we pretty much documented everything here and except the fact that there were two possibilities that the course of a bio was covered, December 6th through the 12th. And if it happened on that period of time, that throws off our calculation completely but it did happen on June 13th through the 19th. How do we know that? Well, it's only logical. Why did uh, Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem? Well, there was a census. Well, let me ask you, a Roman census. Let me ask you, what was the purpose of the Roman census? Well, it was to, to, to decide how much you owed in taxes. Well, would it be very popular with the uh, people to have to go in the dead of winter to be counted so that they could figure out how much they were going to pay in taxes? Of course not. Well, what else? Well, Mary was full-term pregnant. It was 70 miles from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem. And you didn't jump in a car and in an hour, an hour and 15 minutes cover 70 miles in the comfort of heat or air conditioning. The mode of transport was donkey back. Now, she couldn't have done that full term in the dead of winter. Uh, the last point, where were the shepherds uh, the, the, when Jesus was born? They were in the field. Well, you see, the sheep are not, and the shepherds are not in the field uh, past October 25th of each month, or each year, I should say. So what does that mean? It means December 25th, when they say Jesus was born, the shepherds would not have been in the field. Uh, they would have been back in the sheep cots. So uh, through the understanding the course of Abiah, uh, we've been able to tie First Chronicles to the first chapter of Luke and determine the actual conception date and birth date of Jesus Christ. Now, many people on December 25th, uh, I, I understand, uh, it's a pagan holiday. And it, the, it's a birth date of uh, one of the queens of heaven of the Egyptians. Now, if you want to celebrate the birth of one of the queens of heaven of the Egyptians uh, on December 25th, have at it. 
but I for one am going to celebrate the conception of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh. Got a short message, we'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. There we are back again. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the U.S. and our good friends to the north in Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free, call, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others, particularly our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. If you're studying via the internet or some other means somewhere around the world and unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in as well. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone. You don't number, you don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. Make time each day. You know, in the morning is a good time, I find, just to pray. And then always before I go to sleep at night to kind of turn your uh, problems, your troubles of the world over to Him and then sleep like a baby. It's a good thing to do. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, their problems, illness and families, Father. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world and their families, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up, we have Gary in Oregon. What do you know about Jabez in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 2, verse 55? Was Jabez of the Kenites? Uh, yes, that's, that's, you know, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55 is a very important verse. Uh, one, it documents that the Kenites survived the flood of Noah's time because that's centuries after the time of Noah's flood. First Chronicles 2 verse 55 reads, And the families of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, Jabez is a place, by the way, not a person, then three peoples are listed. These are the Kenites that come of Hemath or Hamath, other places the meaning the Kenites. So the Jabez is the location, not the ancestor to the Kenites. It's also important there because we learn that they were scribes right smack dab in the middle of Judah's genealogy in chapter 2, 3, and 4 of First Chronicles. You find the Kenites have already slipped in. That's the important thing about understanding the key of David, is understanding those who say they are claimed to be of our brother Judah, but do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. That's the key of David, uh, Revelation chapter 2, 9 and 3, 9. My words, nope, those are the Lord's words, the synagogue of Satan, check it out, uh, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. Elizabeth in Wisconsin, in your opinion, are the sanctuary cities twisting the use of the city 
of refuge. Well, I don't see any connection. Sanctuary cities were for protecting people who were innocent of murder, premeditated lie in wait murder. For example, if a man were using an ax, and this is an example given in the law, and the ax head comes flying off of the handle <clears throat> and strikes someone else and kills them, that's an accident. That's not premeditated lie in wait murder. So in that event, in the purpose of the sanctuary cities, uh, the priest cities also called, uh, there were three on the west side of Jordan, three on the east side of Jordan. And the person who this accident happened to could flee to the city of refuge and be protected from uh, retaliation from the family of the deceased. But another function of the cities of refuge, and I think the one you're overlooking, Elizabeth, was to determine whether or not the person actually could claim refuge in that city. You see, it might be that they're uh, lying and they actually did lie in wait, premeditate murder. It was up to the priest in the priestly cities, the cities of refuge, to make a determination as to that fact. And if it was determined that the person was actually guilty of premeditated lie in wait murder, uh, they were responsible for making sure they were sent back to the city where the crime happened and so justice could be meted out. Clinton in Indiana, <clears throat> my question for Pastor Dennis Murray is why are there 24 elders in the book of Revelation? Who exactly are they? Are they the angels, men, or are they just beings like the four creatures around the throne of God? Is it two for each tribe of Israel? If this makes it on the air, I'll be looking for it. God willing, thank you and your team for all that you do. Well, you're welcome and it's a labor of love. Well, the uh, number 24, as we learned in the 24th chapter of First Chronicles, has priest written all over it. Uh, the 24 courses of the priest we were just talking about in our lesson today. And these 24 uh, thrones, if you will, were, and they each had 24 you know, persons, or the angels, I'm going to say, were there, and they each had a crown on their head. And I think they are in a priestly role. Uh, you can't, I can't document this, but I believe it's the 12 patriarchs of Israel, in other words, the sons of Jacob, uh, Reuben, Levi, uh, Judah, etc. Uh, and the 12 disciples, <clears throat> I believe, is who are on those thrones, around the throne of God. Cassie in Oklahoma. My mother passed away when I was nine months old. When the new world begins, will I get to see her and will I know her? We will uh, know our relations, our relatives, and spiritual bodies. <coughs> Excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 25 and 26 document this because in spiritual bodies, which everything from Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end of uh, chapter 48, we're in spiritual bodies. It's in the millennium period. And the Zadok of Ezekiel 44, verse 25 and 26 will be able to go to their immediate family who did not take part in the first resurrection of Revelation chapter uh, 20, verse 4, 5, and 6, and help them. Well, to go to them, they would have to recognize them. Only makes sense. Sarah in Pennsylvania, thank you for your teaching of our Father's Word. You're sure welcome. Uh, you've helped me to understand. The Apostle John that Jesus loved which was John, was, which John was he? Thank you, God bless. Well, it was John the Apostle, uh, the son of Zebedee and Salome. Uh, and his brother was James, was also an apostle. Gretthal, I believe this is, Gretthal, G-R-E-T-H-A-L, I hope I pronounced that right, from Colorado. 
Did Christ's crucifixion cover all our sins, past, present, and future? Or do we need to repent for our sins committed since his crucifixion? You can't repent for sins until you have committed that sin. So uh, it isn't possible that any of us had sins before the crucifixion. Uh, that was 2,000 plus uh, years ago, so I don't know what you mean. Uh, I guess you're talking about people who were alive when Jesus was crucified. But again, uh, those people, it's interesting to note, the ones who passed away under the law, Jesus went to them as it's recorded in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. He went to the prisoners and preached the gospel, the good news. In chapter 4, we learn of 1 Peter, many believed. Jared in Mississippi, what is going to happen to all of our flesh bodies at the second advent? Well, you can read about that in the New Testament, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and the following verses. In the twinkling of the eye, uh, the corruptible must take on incorruptible, meaning our flesh bodies uh, we step out of them into our spiritual bodies. And when does that happen? The twinkling of an eye at the seventh trump, the last trump. Uh, Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12, and the following verses gives you a little more graphical description of what happens to the flesh bodies when the spirit body steps out. <clears throat> Excuse me, Phil in Georgia. Why would God force Paul to convert? I heard pastors say that God forced Paul to convert. Well, you know, some folks have free will. Some folks have been chosen since the foundations of the world, the catabol, and I'm referring to Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 4. The Lord struck Paul down on the road to Damascus. And uh, he said, Paul, Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks? Uh, that is the kintron, the, the, the main point. You're, and why is, what did he mean by that? He said, you're attacking Christians. Paul was just as zealous against Christianity as he was for Christianity after he was struck down by the Lord on the road to Damascus. And uh, Paul was hauling Christians out of their homes and throwing them in jail, having them beaten and everything else. So... Uh, Paul obviously did not have free will. He was God's chosen vessel uh, to uh, take the word forward to the elect, to the kings and queens of the ethnos, and, and that was his commission. Carol in Pennsylvania, in John chapter 10, verse 16, who are the sheep? Are they the believers? You got it, yes, you're correct. Um, we are all working to bring them into the fold. In other words, back into the flock of sheep of believers, but they are non-believers, the one talked about in chapter 10, verse 13. Uh, that's why I work so hard to do what I do, is to reach as many of those sheep as we possibly can. <clears throat> Harland in Nebraska, what can how can we lose our salvation? Well, you can lose your salvation uh, by committing the unforgivable sin is one way. Uh, I don't care if you're saved. I don't care if you're one of God's elect. If you commit the unforgivable sin, you're going to lose your salvation. Uh, and I'm referring to Luke chapter 12, verse 10 through 13. And if one of God's election refuse the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up before the Antichrist. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is the unforgivable sin. Everyone will be held accountable for sins that you have not repented of before you pass away. So uh, that's a good idea to repent often as long as you mean it. You can't con God. Robert in Louisiana. What is the difference in those that sleep in Christ and those that are dead in Christ? There is no difference. Uh, they are both people who have passed away believing in Jesus Christ. 
uh, what is it, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about those who are asleep in verse 13. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning where those who are asleep are. He's talking about where those who are dead are. They're already with the Father is the lesson. <clears throat> Ray in Canada, in the millennium, will anybody have any remembrance of this, the second flesh, earth age, flesh age? Yes, I believe so. Uh, it would not be fair of the Lord to hold souls accountable for something that they had no memory of. That, that just doesn't uh, add up. Not going to happen. Julie, and I don't know where Julie's from, please explain Exodus chapter 20. Well, that covers a lot, and I wish you'd be a little more specific with your question. Uh, in Exodus chapter 20, you find the Ten Commandments. That's one location. You can also uh, find the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And again, please be a little more specific with your question than asking me to explain a whole chapter. Are we supposed to pray to the mother? Here at Shepherd's Chapel, we only pray to the Lord and we do it in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, which gives us uh, credentials as a Christian. Marcin in Michigan, Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, power to give, power to the image of the beast, What's the image? Well, the image in the Greek language is icon, and it, it is a likeness. In other words, something that looks like something else. Figuratively, uh, an image is a representation or a resemblance. Now, in Revelation chapter 13, we have two distinct beasts. You need to keep up with that. The first is a one world political beast. The second is the Antichrist. So uh, there are two beasts, as I said. The first one that's talked about is the one world political. Then you say, what's the number of the beast? You find that in Revelation 13, verse 18. The number of the beast is 600, uh, three score and six, which is 666. The Antichrist comes in the sixth seal. He comes in the sixth trump. He comes in the sixth plague. Hope that helps. Leon in Georgia, what should I tell a non-believer about God if they don't believe? Well, plant a seed and let it go. You know, I know as bad as you want someone to see the truth as you have seen and to believe, it's not up to you to make that happen. It's, it's on God's time frame, His schedule. And our job is to plant seeds. Uh, what that person does with that information is entirely up to them and God. Uh, there's scripture in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, that talks about not casting your pearls before swine. And that's exactly what that's talking about, is uh, you don't cast the uh, wisdom and knowledge of God's worth before pigs. You're wasting your time is what the lesson. Lucy in Florida, when you can't tell summer from winter as a sign of the end times, is that in the Bible? No, but uh, we learn in Genesis chapter 8 verse 22, it states as long as the earth exists, there will be a summer and a winter. Uh, no global warming in God's word. You see, yeah, and I agree that the world is not what it was when God created it. Man has done a pretty good job of messing it up. But God is going to return and the earth is going to be rejuvenated. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 21. There will be a new heaven and a new earth at that time and it's going to be just exactly like God created it to be inhabited and His throne will come here and this is where the eternity will be. Earth is God's favorite, Jerusalem more specifically, is God's favorite place on earth. <clears throat> Jason in California, <clears throat> was Jonah a disciple? <clears throat> Excuse me, no, Jonah was one of the minor prophets. 
the Greek form of the name is Jonas, J-O-N-A-S. Uh, Jonas was the father of the disciple and later apostle uh, Peter. Uh, that is why Simon Peter was often called Simon Bar Jonas. Bar is son, uh, Jonas was his father, son of Jonas. John in Canada, in the April newsletter, the word dizygotic, what does this word mean? Well, it's derived uh, from, it means derived from two ova, two eggs uh, from a mother. Look up fraternal, as in fraternal twins in a Webster's Dictionary, and you'll find the word dizygotic, and that's the, uh, the type of uh, fertilization which is required to produce fraternal twins, meaning that there were two separate eggs, and that makes it possible for there to be one father of one of the eggs and a completely different father from a different egg. Ask your medical doctor if that's not possible. Carl in West Virginia, how can Cain and Abel be twins since they have different fathers? They were fraternal twins, an excellent time for that question to come up, meaning that they were derived from two eggs, um, ova as they're called uh, more scientifically. Two eggs, uh, dizygotic, that can be fertilized by different fathers. The serpent in the Garden of Eden was the father of Cain, uh, Adam was, on the other hand, the father of Abel, whom Cain murdered. That's the reason you won't find Cain in Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. Why? Because he wasn't his son. Out of time, I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. When your Heavenly Father looks down and He sees you with the letter He wrote to you and you're seeking knowledge of Him and how to be pleasing to Him, it makes His day. Blessings are always going to follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, and it's this, beloved, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in His Word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.